Hi guys, it's Oshale here and welcome back to my channel, Oshi Reads. And in today's video, I'm going to be doing the book booktube <laughs> already. Can't talk. I'm going to be doing the booktube real talk tag and this is the 2.0 version. I believe I've already done the original version, so I will tag that right now if you want to go check that out. But in this video, I will be doing the 2.0 upgraded new and improved let's spill that booktube tea version oh so first i just want to shout out the creators of this tag we have books with Alyssa j and also julia sapphire i will tag both of their videos and channels down below so i do want to give credit to them before we begin question number one if you could give yourself one piece of advice when you started making videos what would that be Honestly, I would have to say if I could give myself one piece of advice when I started making videos, I would tell myself, do not let the numbers define you. Do not let your subscriber count define you. That is not your worth as a creator, um, as a booktuber, as someone who enjoys being on this platform and enjoys engaging with others and you know, having dialogue and creating really meaningful and insightful content. What your subscriber count is does not divine, divine, <laughs> does not define your value or your worth on this platform. It does not define your quality of work. And you should always continue to push yourself to be greater, to you know, be more creative, to think more out of the box, and to constantly kind of push the boundaries of what you're capable of. That is the advice that I would give myself because what ended up happening is because of my lack of growth for so long, I really just lost momentum and I became really depressed and I kind of gave up on, on YouTube a little bit and I gave up on, you know, gave up on the idea of being seen and being recognized as worthy. And I think that's because I put so much emphasis on the subscriber count and I was playing the comparison game where I was watching others who had started at a similar time to me and I kept watching their subscriber count grow and grow without, you know, what seemed to me much effort on their part or even through long hiatuses of them not posting videos for months or for some people even years and yet they continue to gain subscribers. And of course there's so many nuances and different levels to why that is. It has to do with, you know, the racism on the platform, the colorism, the biases, the prejudices, the YouTube algorithm. I could go on and on, but I definitely would go back and just tell myself just to continue and to not give up and to push through that overwhelming sense of underachievement as though I wasn't achieving enough, doing enough to be seen and recognized and that's why people weren't subscribing to me or that I wasn't engaging enough or worthy enough of the subscribers. I definitely would tell myself just to ignore that and to push through that and to keep going and I definitely do think that my, my platform would be would be more representative of who I am and would show more phases of my evolution over the years, not just with my reading, but just as a person. And I feel like there are huge gaps in my journey shown here on this channel because I did give up so many times and I grew weary of basically fighting the good fight without seeing any returns you know, and not seeing the returns that I felt were worthy of the effort that I was putting in. So I say all that to say, I would tell myself to keep going, to not give up, to make content for myself and to focus on the subscribers I do have or, and to continue to push the boundaries creatively. Question number two, what are your thoughts on cancel culture? Now I've discussed this in a previous video, which I will link right now, but you know, as we grow and as time marches on, we evolve and we think differently and our thoughts you know evolve and we learn more and even from day to day we're not the same people i still have the same thoughts on cancel culture for the most part i do however feel like it's much too punitive it's much too punitive and also it's 
it's it's starting not to mean anything right because people get canceled and the internet moves on to the next scandal and these people still have supporters and they're able to come back and bounce back and you know time moves on as if nothing's ever happened and these people basically just went through a rough cycle of cyberbullying for a moment and then time moves on also a lot of these people who are canceling others are practicing hypocrisy and it's that it's that same added adage that same adage of people in glass houses shouldn't th throw stones you know what i mean like mm, you're living in a glass house maybe you shouldn't throw stones yourself that kind of truth to it so i do still basically have the same thoughts on cancel culture however i do feel that we have we have abused that term and it no longer holds any meaning i also feel like it's too punitive it's hypocritical in many ways it is not effective and it has sort of become this new wave of cyberbullying it's become cyberbullying repackaged because with cancel culture we completely take out the fact that people do change and change is possible you know we're all on a journey and evolution and growth is absolutely possible in each individual and it's possible for people to change their viewpoints become more educated and less ignorant it's possible for people to have a change of heart it's possible for people to truly recognize their wrongdoings and truly repent and sort of start on a new path and turn around from their old ways all of these things are possible but cancel culture completely negates the possibility of that even happening and negates the truth of that the fact of that you know and so that's what I don't like about cancel culture there is no such thing as second or third chances with cancel culture and I do not like that now of course there are so many nuances involved when it comes to people changing you know is it change for the better is it actual change or is it just for clout for social media for an image rev revamp we could go into it we could talk about it all day long but those are my issues with cancel culture and uh, yeah Go check out my video. Question number three. Do you consider booktube to be a welcoming community? I think that it honestly depends on what side of booktube that you're on. Yes, we are a smaller community here on YouTube and we're not as large as say the beauty community or or the gaming community or the vloggers or the DIYers and I could go on and on. We are very small and we are growing every day but we're not so small that we don't have different corners of this community. And I feel like a lot of the feeling of alienation that people feel, the harassment that people experience, the outright bullying and mean girl tactics that people are experiencing have a lot more to do with the side of booktube that they're on and the booktubers and or audience members or subscribers if you will that they're engaging with i feel like a lot of this is connected to book twitter and that toxicity that's involved with a certain side of book twitter i think it has a lot to do with that so i feel that a lot of people join this community are so gung-ho about it things start off well and then they join book twitter and you know they get into tiffs with people they get into disagreements with people all of a sudden their booktube friends have turned on them now there's all this drama they're being ostracized and frozen out and iced out of you know trips and meet and greets and vlogger trips collaborations and buddy reads and readathons right you have this newfound group of friends that they thought they'd amassed and now they're being iced out and cut out of the group and ostracized they're no longer in the group chat and their friends have gone on to now do collaborations with one another visit one another vlog with one another attend cons with one another and now they're doing you know collaboration videos together readathons together starting book clubs together and so I think that's where the unwelcoming feeling comes in for that individual that was cut out and the feelings of alienation and uh, feeling ostracized so you know that was a very specific example but I feel like a lot of smaller creators can in this space in this booktube space can relate to that because either they've experienced it or they've watched it happen whether within the friend group or from afar so I think that welcoming question is very particular to what side of booktube that you're on the people that you've managed to meet through you know the booktube community and the connections you've managed to make and whether the friendships you've made are genuine friendships or not and if a friendship is so 
flimsy that it can be completely destroyed by simply having a difference of opinion whether it be on a social issue or regarding a particular book even or author those are not your friends guys <laughs> it's not real friendship and you know of course things can definitely get misconstrued on twitter because you know any type of tone can be taken with just words and when you're not actually speaking to one another i think that's where a lot of these conflicts come in you have people not actually speaking to one another face to face either via you know skype or facetime what i have you whatever video conferencing software and instead it's just a lot of words being exchanged back and forth on you know fill in the social media platform here uh that's where things can go awry so all in all i do feel that book tube is welcoming depending upon who you associate yourself with and what side of booktube you're on number four what are your thoughts on booktube consumerism and do you feel pressured to buy books or rather book consumerism in general i do have another video on this i did i want to say it was about a year ago now i will link that i think i really delved deeply and covered all sides of the topic in regards to my personal thoughts i do not feel pressured to buy books any longer now i will say that my pressure to buy books in the beginning definitely came from booktube and i was a watcher of booktube long before i joined booktube and i was watching booktube booktube back in 2010 was it 2010 I think it was more 2011 2012 not so far back as 2010 2011 and 12 i was a huge watcher of the og booktubers and there were a lot of hauls there was a huge emphasis on book hauls on bookshelf tours and i always dreamed of having that but i was in, living in extreme poverty at the time in new york city and i just did not have the disposable income to indulge in that so when i finally did get to a place where i could financially indulge in that i definitely went wild especially after i started my channel hauls were so popular and i was trying to gain traction and an audience and subscriber count i'm not gonna lie i was trying to gain more subscribers so i did a lot of hauls and i really enjoyed buying books at that time i will say my book buying has slowed down exponentially since then i would say within the last two years when I had to move back in with my parents, my book buying pretty much came to a screeching halt because I was living in a tiny little room and there just wasn't space. I had one shelf, all of my things were in storage. So a lot of the books that I got were either from book of the month or there were, you know, certain sales on book outlet. I would get like three books here, four books here. Majority of the books that I got with, you know, during the nearly two years that I lived with my parents, Again, I lived with them twice within the course of five years. It's fine, millennial, millennial here. Uh, were through pre-orders, you know, pre-ordering a lot of books from my favorite authors, especially YA authors that I was highly anticipating. And that's how I kind of collected books over the years. But I say all that to say that I don't feel pressure to buy books any longer. And I think that solely because I am more than comfortable with the amount of books that I own. And in fact, it does make me feel guilty that I essentially have more unread books than read books on my shelf at this moment. And it's starting to give me a, a panicky feeling. I do want to start reading the books that I already own. I also want to start unhauling the books that I know deep down in my soul I will probably never read. And, you know, I am a mood reader, so whatever mood I was in when I purchased that book has long passed and I no longer feel the need or the urge to read that book. I'm no longer interested. So I do definitely want to purge my shelves, do an unhaul, and then I also want to start actually reading the books on my shelf. And that is definitely something I'm thinking about seriously for 2020 as a challenge for myself on this channel. I do a lot of Kindle reading, Kindle Unlimited, ebooks, and I don't actually read the books on my shelf because I'm so busy reading on my Kindle and reading ebooks and utilizing Kindle Unlimited and reading a lot of urban, oh, I hate that word, but that's the, the genre it falls in, urban, um, I call it street lit. Let's just, let's just go with that on this channel. I read a lot of street lit. I read a lot of new adult. I read a lot of romance. I read a lot of uh, black love romances and all of those are mostly found on my Kindle. And that's just where I read the fastest and I can consume them the easiest as opposed to buying the physical books. It's just cheaper too. So I do wanna start a project for 2020. I'm thinking, this is not an announcement, where I focus on reading the books already on my shelf, the physical books, and really just lowering that amount of 
of to be read versus read and so that's one of the reasons I don't feel pressured to buy books any longer I will say that the slight pressure can come from bookstagram now not necessarily uh, booktube I don't really watch booktube as much as I used to I found other avenues on YouTube to kind of satisfy me especially with the commentary section I love commentary but I digress book Instagram. Bookstagram is tough because I love bookshelves and when I see people with these beautiful bookshelves you know five six seven eight twelve bookshelves like libraries a whole room of wall-to-wall -wall shelves I do get bookshelf envy and I start to think to myself oh do I need to buy more books oh my gosh they have so many books and then I know that if I were actually to fulfill that for myself I would have so much anxiety with the amount of unread books that would be on my shelves I mean I already have anxiety now and I only have two full shelves, one small shelf, and then I have a pile of books in the corner that my mirror is sitting on. So I could probably fill another two shelves, right? And I already have anxiety behind that. And I got these little shelves back here. So let me stop. Let me just enjoy the aesthetic on Bookstagram. <laughs> Question number five. Would you consider yourself a critical reader slash reviewer? This is a tough one because when I read a book, there's so many factors that go into why I enjoy that book. The first factor is that personal factor, which has more to do with who I am as a person, my personal life experiences that I bring to that particular book and that reading experience, how I connect with the characters, how I connect with the stories. There are certain tropes that I enjoy more than others. There's certain types of writing that I enjoy more than others. There are certain authors that I enjoy more than others. So there's so many factors involved. I feel like I have two brains when I'm reading because I'm also a writer. I have my critical brain that's able to critique a book and really look into it, deep dive while I'm reading and basically point out the inconsistencies, the plot holes, with especially a lot of self-published books and ebooks, the spelling, grammatical errors, the places where the wrong character names were used or the setting is not accurate to the time or place. The world building is lacking. I can definitely critically analyze and, and, and see all of these things and see all of these issues within the work and still fully enjoy the story and still absolutely love the story, love the characters and be completely swept up in the world and be excited to be on the journey. Those are two my, my two brains, like my storytelling brain who's really able to fully understand a well thought, thought out story idea that may not be executed as well as it could have been but it's good enough for me to to lose myself in the story and really enjoy it you know certain things don't really pull me out of the story as much as they say they that it should you know someone using the wrong character name is not enough to it pulls me off for a moment but it's not enough for me to stop reading a book um spelling errors grammatical errors are not enough as long as they're not gratuitous in every other sentence are not enough to to stop me from reading a book or continuing on with a book. So I feel like I have two brains. I have my critical brain going and I also have my my personal, you know, my personal enjoyment of it outside of the super critical side. So I, I think I am, but I also think I'm able to still fully enjoy a story despite the critiques that I'm having of it at the same time. Question number six, do you take part in readathons and what are your thoughts on them? Well, 2019 was definitely the year of the readathon. Oh my goodness. This readathon thing really exploded with people taking ownership of it. I feel as though in years past, people felt as if only certain booktubers were allowed to do readathons, usually the ones with the bigger platforms and the bigger subscriber count and the more clout and the more prestige they were allowed to do and do not just do but start readathons, but oh no, not I with you know my my 3,000, 2,000 subscribers, 1,000, you know, whatever. So I feel as though small, smaller content creators in our space really took ownership of the readathon thing and ran with it. And I absolutely loved seeing it. My book club and I even did our own readathon, the Throwbackathon, where we really indulged in favorite classics from our childhood with different prompts. And it's definitely something we're going to continue in the years to come and grow as much as possible. The Throwbackathon is definitely not something that I would have ever envisioned myself doing in years past just because I never felt worthy enough or like it was my place to be one to create a readathon so that's why I really appreciate 2019 being a year of smaller content creators to mid-level content creators taking 
control of that narrative and really owning the readathon space. Now, my thoughts on readathons, I feel like they are great. They are collaborative. They are very creative. There are ways for smaller creators to not only get their names out there and their channels out there, but also to showcase their creativity, their ideas, books that they love, and ignite and foster dialogues that may not otherwise happen on this platform. There have been a lot of great social issues discussed that have come out of these readathons, and also a lot of great books that people have discovered that may they may have not known of before because of the readathons. So I love readathons. I don't get a chance to participate in them as much as I would like. I feel like there are so many going on, and many of them are going on at the same time, that it gets it gets kind of murky deciding, you know, what are all the readathons going on in a month? Which ones am I going to participate in? Also, I feel as though readathons do make me feel pressured to read. And I'm such a mood reader that <laughs> ironically, when I feel pressured to read certain books or I've picked out a TBR, it then makes me not want to read those particular books. I don't know why. Just call me crazy. Question number seven is to recommend a book with a topic or issue that you are passionate about. And for this one, I chose a book that is a little bit out of the box for some of you. It is an erotic romance book with two black ma main protagonists featuring black love, hashtag black love, let me not do this, let me just say hashtag black love. And this is the Love Unaccounted For series by Love Belvin. And this series is definitely, <laughs> It's definitely not for everybody. It features BDSM aspects and a pastor and his journey to finding love with his wife. That's all I'm going to say. Highly recommend the series. It's one of my all time favorites. The reason I'm recommending it is because one of the topics or issues that I'm super passionate about is the topic of finding your purpose, right? Of you as a human being knowing who you are knowing your gifts and your talents, acknowledging them, knowing your worth, and sort of finding out why you were put on this planet, why you're here, what you're good at, and what your passion is, and pursuing that wholeheartedly. I am so passionate about this because I feel as if we are living in a time where people are just existing from day to day. We're living in a time where mental health issues are at an all-time high. We're living in a time where depression and, you know, comparison being the thief of joy and you know oversaturation of toxic media images toxic imaging and branding overuse and oversaturation of social media as a way to brainwash us and sort of indoctrinate us into this way of thinking that's really toxic and not actually good for our souls I feel as if we are living in that time and I think it's only going to get worse. I think with the expansion of social media and the integration of technology into all that we do and all the aspects of our daily lives, I think that these this topic will become even more important because people are dead inside and they're just existing and they're just living from day to day and they're just trying to survive. And I feel that in order to thrive, you have to figure out who you are, who you truly are, your soul, and you need to figure out your giftings, your talents, what makes you happy, and a lot of times it's it's found outside of yourself, and that's your purpose. Your purpose is found outside of you. It's beyond you. I think sometimes we're so internal, and that's what makes us unhappy because we're not serving others, and we're not serving humanity. We're not serving the planet, so your purpose is basically using your gifts and talents projected outwards and it's outside of you in order to better the world around you in what whatever way whether it's being a teacher or working in the mental health industry <laughs> industry sounds weird working in the mental health field or you know even being a songwriter or working somewhere else in the arts i feel as if finding your passion and finding your purpose is so instrumental into you fulfilling your full potential as a human being on this planet and also into bringing some type of joy and peace into your existence and fulfillment more than anything else into your existence so got a little bit deep there but that's definitely something i'm really passionate about i especially love speaking to young people about this because i feel as if the younger generation definitely gets lost in the sh in the shuffle <laughs> gets lost in the shuffle with all of the social media and imaging branding and toxic messages being you know just showcased all over the place so yeah and that's it for this video thank you so much for joining me once again mm -hmm. I got this little one here wanting to play a game with me, so I'm going to go.
and play with Mr. Tobey. And I will catch you guys in my next video. Bye, guys. Mwah. Bye. Oh, now you don't want to play. I say goodbye, and now you don't want to play. You're trying to sabotage me. Saboteur. 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 Her. 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 <laughs> Came from my whole face. Bye.